Well, let's go ahead and get started. I, I, when I was younger, used to be deathly afraid of like roller coasters and thrill rides. Now, they always looked fun to me. I thought they looked like a good time. But in my mind, I had this idea that if I got on one of these death traps, that the minute the ride started, my seat would fling open and I would launch off into the sky. And I don't know if you can look at me and tell, but I'm not winning a war against gravity. And I'm also from Mississippi. And so I knew the kind of people that were operating these rides did not instill confidence. But when I was in middle school, one year we decided to go to the state fair and my sister, now she is a thrill seeker. And she decided that when we were there that she wanted to ride the fireball. Now, it's not what it sounds like. It's not something that goes in circle. That was the ring of fire, something different. The fireball is much scarier. It's a giant pendulum that swings back and forth. And as it swings, it spins and it rotates. Yeah, sounds like fun, right? No. So she decides she wants to ride this. She's excited about it, but she has no one to ride with her. So what does she do naturally? She takes her little brother and drags me along for the ride. Now, I will tell you, I did not want to go. I was terrified of this ride. Nothing about this seemed fun to me at all, even though she tried to make it, right? I mean, she used all of the typical things she would say, you know, hey, look, you're going to have a great time. It'll be a lot of fun. Don't worry about it. Your adrenaline is going to kick in. I think only one person has died on it. I mean, she really pulled out all the stops, but I was reluctant, but I agreed. So at first, everything's fine. Honestly, we get in line, we're waiting, and finally we make it up to the guy, we hand him our tickets, and everything's good until I put my first foot onto the ride. And at that moment, heart sinks to the bottom of my chest, I freeze, and I start doing everything else that I can. I start second guessing myself, I start writing my last will and testament. I'm doing everything but getting onto this ride. And finally, one of the fair workers walks over to me with his very eloquent accent, and he says, all right, are you in or are you out? took a deep breath. I said, all right, I'm in. So I get in the seat, they strap me in, and away we went. And I got to tell y'all, that's the most fun I've had on a ride in my entire life. I mean, it was magnificent. It was terrifying. It was exhilarating all at once. And by the time we got off of this ride, I was begging my sister to get right back on it. See, getting on the fireball, it changed everything for me because I went from hating thrill rides to loving anything that gets my adrenaline going. But I wouldn't have had that kind of experience if I had not made the decision to get on the ride. See, in that moment, I had a critical decision to make. Was I in or was I out? And thankfully, I made the decision to be all in, and it changed everything for me. Well, we're continuing our series, Death to Life, this morning, where we've been taking the past few weeks to walk through some of Jesus' last moments and teachings before his arrest and crucifixion on the cross. Now, if you haven't been with us for the past few weeks, I would highly encourage you to go back and listen to all of the sermons before. There's three before this one. And the reason for this is this series, more than any other that we've preached through, is heavily connected to each other. And so what we're doing each week is really kind of building on the teachings of the sermon before it. And so today we're going to hit kind of a crescendo of sorts with Jesus' teaching. See, in the first week we talked about who Jesus is and the abundant life that he offers. The next week, we talked about that you can't really have this abundant life without a deep, growing relationship with Jesus that goes beyond Sunday mornings. And last week, we talked about the Holy Spirit and how we have access to the power of God through that active and growing relationship. And so this week, as we've made it through three weeks, and we've talked about all these different things, now we've come to the question, where do we go from here? Well, over these past three weeks, you've heard us talk about this concept of moving from decided to discipled. And the reality is, is that a majority of Christians never leave this first category of decided. And maybe that's you. Maybe one time you made a decision to follow Jesus, but you never moved beyond that decision. And so all you've done through life is you've decided to follow Jesus, but you've just gone through life going through the motions never committed. Or maybe you're here in, and you've wanted to be in this category of decided, but you feel like you're not ready to really make big change. And so what you do is you kind of start to take these small steps of commitment whenever it's convenient for you, and we try to justify that as growth. And so maybe you start serving, you know, once a month, like, I mean, if it fits your schedule, you know, that's very important. Or maybe you told someone you'd pray about joining a community group. I mean, you weren't really going to join it, but you prayed about it, which is good, right? And so your commitment is based on these moments of convenience 
rather than complete surrender. So can we get really honest for a second though? Is that really what Jesus meant by being his disciple? I wanna remind you that this is Jesus who said that to be his disciple, you'd have to take up your cross and follow him daily. This is Jesus who said that in order to to gain life, you would have to lose life. This is Jesus that said whoever would be his follower would have to hate their father and mother. This is Jesus who called Peter to step out of the boat onto the Sea of Galilee and walk to him. Jesus isn't calling you to dip your toes in the water of faith. He's calling you to dive headfirst into discipleship. Because the reality is, is to be a disciple of Jesus means you have to be all in. So here's the deal. Nathan and I, we cannot preach you from decided to disciple. We can share illustrations, we can share data, we can share quotes and arguments, and we can preach in the most effective and engaging and persuasive ways possible. But it's not gonna do it. See, becoming a disciple, it's not about hearing a powerful message. It's about making a critical decision. And so as we talked about this idea of moving from decided to discipled, you have a decision to make this morning. And that decision is, will you continue to go through life, going through the motions, or will you commit fully to God? Will you remain decided or will you become a disciple? Will you commit fully to God or will you be decided and never discipled? And so this morning, my goal is to get you to this point of decision and to answer the question, are you in or are you out? So if you have your Bibles or Bible apps with you this morning, you can open those up to John 16 and that's where we're gonna be for all of today. And as we pick up in our story today, Jesus is about to share in his last moment of teaching with his disciples. This is right before he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane and is arrested. And in this moment, Jesus is gonna take an opportunity to kind of lay out what's about to happen for his disciples. And you're gonna find that the disciples are faced with the same decision that we are. So let's start by looking at verses 16 through 18 this morning. Jesus went on to say, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. At this, some of his disciples said to one another, well, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me, and because I am going to the Father? They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. So as Jesus begins this moment with his disciples, as he starts to teach them, Jesus begins with talking about his death and his resurrection. Now, the language that Jesus uses here is somewhat vague, but what you need to understand is this isn't even the first time the disciples have heard about Jesus' death and resurrection. We know that Jesus actually tells them earlier in his ministry, explicitly telling them in Matthew 16 that he would have to die, but that he would raise from the grave three days later. So this isn't new to them. But in both instances, the disciples are confused. In Matthew 16, Peter actually tries to rebuke Jesus for saying that he would die. And in our passage this morning, the disciples are questioning back and forth amongst themselves about Jesus and what he's saying. So it's worth asking, how do the people who have spent the past three years of their life with Jesus still not understand who he is and what he's talking about. To the disciples, they didn't really understand what Jesus was saying because it didn't really match the idea of Jesus they had in their heads. See, the disciples thought that Jesus had come to be a conquering Messiah. There was a belief in Judaism that the Messiah would come, he would overthrow the Roman rule, and he would restore the nation of Israel to its former glory of the Old Testament. And so they expected that Jesus would be an earthly king who had an earthly kingdom and that they would rule alongside him. And we know this, James and John, two of his disciples, actually fight over which one of them would get to sit next to Jesus on his throne. And so as Jesus begins talking about death and resurrection and a life of surrender and humility, the disciples don't get it. 
their perception of Jesus got in the way of who Jesus truly was, and it affected the way they responded to him, leading to frustration, doubt, and indecision. Now, you need to understand this issue is not unique to the disciples. The reality is we struggle with the exact same thing. We may not try to make Jesus an earthly king, but we so often bring ideas of what Jesus should be to our relationship with him. That we create this image of Jesus in our head that caters to our ideas and what we believe. And so some of you, you want a casual relationship with Jesus. And so the image of Jesus that you create in your head is that Jesus is meek and loving and forgiving. Now, those are all good things. They're all true. But you neglect the truth that he is Lord and that he is to be worshiped and submitted to in obedience. But some of you, you have the exact opposite problem. Some of you look at God and Jesus like these, these holy judges who are just weighing the scales against you at all the points in your life, and you neglect the saving work of grace that Jesus did. And so the issue with both of these is that when we try to pick and choose which parts of Jesus, when we try to create our own version of Jesus, we cannot reconcile with Scripture. And so it changes the way we respond to him. His teachings don't make sense to us and we can't follow them. And so for those of you who have Jesus as Savior but not as Lord, this concept of being a disciple of Jesus and being all in, it's not going to make sense to you. And it's not going to be important to you because Jesus isn't Lord. But if Jesus is only Lord to you and he is not Savior, then your relationship with Jesus becomes based entirely on works, on the rules, and what you bring to the table as opposed to living in response to what Jesus did for you. And so when we create this false version of Jesus in our lives, we cannot reconcile with Scripture. And so becoming a disciple of Jesus and living this out becomes increasingly difficult for us because we don't understand who he is and we don't understand what he teaches. And the disciples struggle with this exact same thing. Matthew Henry, the famous pastor and theologian, said it this way. He said, the notion of Christ's secular kingdom was so deeply rooted in them that they could make no sense at all of those sayings of his, which they knew not how to reconcile with that notion. So what he's saying is they believe in the earthly kingdom, so when Jesus starts talking about other stuff, they can't get it right. And when we think that the scripture must be made to agree with the false ideas that we have imbibed, no wonder that we complain of difficulty. But when our reasonings are captivated to revelation, the matter becomes easy. If you want to be all in as a disciple of Jesus, you have to submit to who Jesus is. See, the disciples... They struggle with this concept at first. Their perception of Jesus got in the way of their relationship with Jesus. And I don't want you to make the same mistake because it's only gonna lead to frustration and difficulty in your relationship with God. But if you will learn to let go of what you think about Jesus and submit to who Jesus says he is, then becoming a disciple of Jesus and living in response to his commands makes more sense to us. Matthew Henry would say that the matter becomes easy. And so for us, it boils down to the decision of which Jesus do we follow? When we started this series a few weeks ago, Nathan focused on this verse, John 14, 6. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father except through me. See, in one sentence, Jesus lays out who he is, and what we are to believe about him. And so for us, we have to make a decision of is this truly what we believe about Jesus? And so if you ever want to be a disciple of Jesus, if you want to be all in, you need to ask yourself this morning, which Jesus do you follow? Do you follow this false version of Jesus that you've created in your head that caters to you or do you submit to who Jesus is? Do you follow the truth 
submitting to what Scripture says about Jesus and living in response to it. See, ultimately, who Jesus is to you will dictate how you follow him. And so if you can learn to let go of who you think Jesus is and submit to who Jesus says he is, it will change everything for you. And in doing so, in submission to who Jesus is, we begin to understand what it means to be his disciple. We begin to understand what a relationship with Jesus looks like and how we live in response to it. So, being all in as a disciple of Christ requires submission to who Jesus is. Good. Now, I wanna talk to you about what it means to be all in. And I wanna give some details on this and explain to you why this is important. So, we're gonna continue in our verses. These are verses 19 through 28. It says, Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, and so he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while, you'll see me no more, and then after a little while, you'll see me. Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets about the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, you will, my father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. And in that day, you will ask in my name, and I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered into the world. Now, I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. So Jesus understands at this point that his disciples don't really get what he's saying. And so he's going to go into greater detail, very descriptive detail about what's going to happen. And so Jesus starts by reiterating that he's going to die. And he tells his disciples, you will grieve and mourn while the world rejoices. But then he goes back in verse 20 and he says, you will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. Now, He's going to use some descriptions about what this looks like, and he uses the imagery of a woman giving birth to a child. And he says that in the same way that a woman has to endure pain through childbirth, the disciples would have to undergo, undergo great pain and sadness as they watch Jesus be arrested and crucified on a cross. But Jesus said that their grief will turn to joy as he has risen from the grave three days later. Now, this concept of grief to joy is really interesting choice of words for Jesus. Grief or sadness or sorrow is a temporary emotion. But joy is something different. Joy is not really an emotion. Joy is like a mindset change. It's a shift in perspective rather than temporary happiness. And so Jesus' choice of words here in saying that their grief will turn to joy points to a significant and permanent change in the disciples. So it's worth asking the question, what changes for the disciples, right? How do we go from the 12 young, dumb knuckleheads who don't know anything about Jesus to the 12 church leaders who would change the world by taking his message to Asia and Europe? How do you go from Peter, who denies Jesus three different times during Jesus' arrest and crucifixion, to Peter, who stands on a rooftop in Acts 2 and declares that Jesus is Lord and Messiah to all of Jerusalem. We know the big thing that changes for them is the resurrection. Right? When the disciples find the empty tomb, their belief is renewed that Jesus was exactly who he said he was and came to do and did exactly what he said he would do. But it is not simply their belief. It is what the disciples chose to do with their belief that would change everything for them. Look back at verse 27 with me. Jesus tells them that the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. Now that word believed is the Greek word pastuo. 
And what pasuo means, if you're kind of boiling it down to its simplest terms, is faith in action. And so what pasuo is, is a type of belief that is so deeply rooted in you that you believe so strongly that it leads you to respond or to act on what you believe. And so Jesus knew that if the disciples could have this kind of belief, that it would change everything. It would change their lives and it would change the world. Same thing's true for you. See, if you want the kind of radical life change that Jesus offers, if you wanna leave an impact on the world that echoes into eternity, it happens through an act of faith. See, you can't move from decided to discipled if you don't live out your faith instead of just professing it. You have to be committed fully to Jesus. You know, I've been convicted more and more lately from God that I think so often we have the wrong idea of what commitment to Jesus looks like. Because I think so often we look at commitment like it's these tiny steps of obedience, right? And so when we think about commitment, we think about it like these taking these little moments of, okay, you start with faith and then we go to baptism. Okay, and if we got them to baptism, maybe we can get them to serve. And all right, we got them to serve. Now let's see if we can get them to give. Let's see if we can get them involved. And we're kind of taking it little by little, little by little. And we treat our relationship with Jesus like it's meant to be this incremental commitment. But that's not really what it's supposed to be. See, if we're gonna be a disciple of Jesus, a disciple, by definition, replicates the work of of their master. So what does Jesus tell us to replicate? In Luke 9, 23, Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. So being a disciple is lived out in taking up our cross every single day. And taking up your cross, this is no small commitment. This is not some baby step. This is marching to your death. Taking up your cross and being a disciple means that it is a complete surrender of your life. And this is what Jesus is calling us to. That Jesus isn't calling you to take baby steps as a disciple. He's calling you to be fully committed to him and to his kingdom. Look at how Luke describes how the early church acted and lived out in Acts 2, 42 through 47. He said, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, and all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who was in need, and every day they continued to meet together and in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with, with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all of the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So remember, this is right after Jesus' ascension, right? He's resurrected, he's ascended, he tells the disciples, go and make disciples. And this is what the disciples teach people to do, right? When you look at the early church, it becomes pretty clear that they're passionate about God's priorities. They're devoted to Jesus' teachings. They're committed to regularly meeting as the church, Right? They're serving and giving sacrificially. They're deeply involved in close community and they are sharing the gospel of Jesus and making disciples. And when you look at what they do, you'll notice it's not small commitments. It's not these small steps. When people became a follower of Christ, they were all in all at once in that moment. And that's what we're called to. That's what commitment to Jesus looks like. Now, I think where we get confused so often with commitment is that we try to, we kind of mistake what commitment is supposed to look like with what growth is supposed to look like. And they are different. See, our sanctification, which in simple terms means our growth to look more like Jesus, it happens in these small incremental moments. Uh, Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, and this is the ESV translation, He says that, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, right, we're in relationship with God, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. 
So Paul says, look, growth in your relationship with Jesus, it's gonna happen slowly and it's gonna happen over time. But be careful not to mistake the way that we grow with the way that we commit. We commit, we grow in these small moments, but we commit in big ways. And so for us, commitment is supposed to look like being all in. The problem is we so often expect the opposite, right? We want this growth, this big growth and this miraculous life change, but we want it to come from small commitment. But it's the opposite, that we commit fully to God We make big changes and big commitments to Jesus and his kingdom. And if we do that, then we grow closer to and more like Jesus every single day, one degree of glory to the next. It is big commitment that leads to small growth. So, what does this practically look like for you? What does it practically look like for you to be all in? Well, that's gonna depend, if I'm being honest with you, on where you find yourself this morning. For some of you, you may not have a relationship with Jesus, and having a relationship with Jesus as Lord and Savior is the first step in being all in. And so if that's you, here's what I want you to know, that Jesus loves you and he died for you, that the Son of God came to earth, God in flesh as a man, he lived a perfect life, He died on the cross for your sin. He was the final and ultimate payment, a sacrifice for the sins of the world. And he rose from the grave three days later, defeating sin and defeating death, providing eternal life for anyone who would believe in him. And if you want a relationship with Jesus, here's what you do. It's pretty simple, but it's tough to live out. We repent, which means that we turn away from our sin, from the ways that we disobey to God. We confess and believe that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is who he says he is and did what he said he did and we commit to follow him with our lives. It is repentance, belief, and a commitment to Jesus. And so if that's you and you've never made the decision to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior, there is no better day to do that than today. Look, in just a little bit when we get into worship, I'll be in the back of the room. If you wanna make that decision, come talk to me. I would love to be able to do that with you. Now, if you're here in the room and you're a follower of Christ, you did step one. And some of you in this room, you've probably done steps two, three, four, five, six, and so on. But here's the challenge with being all in. The goal isn't to take the next step. It's to take the leap. To be all in for all that God has for you. So you ready for the challenge? It's to get baptized is to serve in the church and serve our missions partners, is to be involved in community groups, it's to be involved in relationships with our people, is to serve one another, it's to give sacrificially, it's to make disciples, it's to make Sunday mornings in church a commitment, it's to make prayer and studying scripture priorities in your life. It is that you become all in and fully committed to all that God has planned and designed for you. That's what being all in means. And listen, we wanna give you plenty of opportunities to do that here at Kara City. One of those is today is Membership Sunday. And if you're not familiar with us and the way we do membership, it's a little different than most churches. To us, membership, it's not about putting your name in a registry and checking a box and sending you a letter of membership. To us, membership is about helping you and challenging you to make a commitment to live out and completely commit to a relationship with Jesus and to serve God and his people. And so today is an opportunity for you to do that. And those commitment cards in your seats, if you look at them, you'll notice that all the stuff that we've talked about over the past four weeks, it's all on that card. And so we wanna challenge you and encourage you to take the step of commitment and move from decided to discipled with us here at Karis City. And we're gonna have an opportunity to do that in communion later. But I also wanna remind you that we have Baptism Sunday coming up on April 7th. That's also our three-year anniversary, which we're really excited about. But if you'd like to be baptized, we would love to help you do that. Baptism by immersion, which means dunking underwater, that is an important step of obedience that we take as followers of Christ. And so if that's something you've never done, I wanna challenge you and encourage you to do that. And that's a great day to do this. If you wanna do that on your commitment card, you can let us know with that. If you've already filled out a commitment card, It's not a big deal. You can either check out uh, or fill out the Connect card or just come talk to me after service and I would love to help you with that. But here's the deal. I gave you a lot just a minute ago. And I understand it's asking a lot of you. 
It's asking a lot of you to commit fully to God. It's asking a lot of you to be involved in every single way possible. And I'll be honest with you, I get that it even sounds a little bit like self-serving. Because there may be some of you here who are a little skeptical and go, I bet you do want us to be involved. I bet you would love for us to start serving and giving. But I want you to understand the heart behind why I'm talking to you about this. This is what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus. This is what it looks like to be fully committed to God and to his kingdom. And so I don't want you to miss out on what God has designed for your life because you've never moved from decided to disciple. And so I wanna challenge you and encourage you not to just try and take some next step of commitment, but to be all in, to fully commit in all areas of your life to God and to his church. And here's what I'll promise you. If you'll do that, you are gonna be blown away by how God moves in your life and in the lives around you. I mean, just think about the disciples alone. All but one disciple left Jesus at his crucifixion. But at the resurrection, the disciples made a commitment to be all in for Jesus. Everyone but one disciple would go on to be killed for their faith. The disciples went from denying and forsaking Jesus to proclaiming his name until the very last breath. And the power of God that worked through these committed disciples was so influential that the gospel has literally reached the ends of the earth over the past 2,000 years. Do you understand what it looks like for the power of God to work in us when we are committed to Jesus? And this power of God It's not just something we get to look at in hindsight from 2,000 years ago. We still see this power today. Earlier you saw a video of Jaylene getting baptized, which I don't know about you, but I love seeing our Karis kids make their public declaration of faith. It's exciting for me to see that we are taking care of and raising up the next generation of followers of Christ. But here's something cool you may not know. Just a few weeks short of one year ago, we baptized Jaylene's mom, Yasmeen. Yasmin made a decision to be all in for Jesus. And we've watched as God has worked in her lives and is working in the lives of her children. And she's not the only example of this. Back in the summer, we had a student get baptized and then a few weeks later, we got to watch as his mom and his sisters got baptized. See, when we are committed to Jesus, God moves in powerful ways. And so if you wanna watch God work in your life, and in the lives of your family, and the lives of the people around you, my challenge to you is be committed fully to Jesus. Don't just take baby steps. Don't just dip your toes into the water of faith, but dive into the deep water of discipleship. Be all in. Look what made our last verses. This is 29 through 33. Then Jesus' disciples said, now you are speaking clearly without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Do you now believe, Jesus replied. A time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, But take heart, I have overcome the world. So we've reached the point of critical decision for the disciples. As Jesus has laid out who he is, what he's gonna do, and what's about to happen, the disciples make a declaration of belief. They say, you are who you said you are, and we believe. And Jesus replies with, do you now believe? Now, you need to understand this isn't Jesus questioning whether the disciples believe. He is well aware that the disciples now do understand who he is and understand what he came to do. And so the question is not whether the disciples believe. The question is, what will the disciples do with that belief? Will they remain decided? uncommitted to Jesus or would they be all in 
Would they commit to truly being the disciples that Jesus has called them to be? Would they be the decided who left Jesus at his crucifixion? Or would they be the disciples who were all in for Jesus and changed the world? Were they in or were they out? Yeah, ultimately, it's the same question you have to ask yourself this morning. Are you in or are you out? See, it all comes down to that critical point of decision today. That you have to make a decision. Will you continue to go through the motions in life, decided but never changed? Or will you commit fully to God and his kingdom? Will you become a disciple of Jesus? I wanna leave you with a quote from St. Ignatius. He was a Spanish theologian and pastor. And in my research for the sermon this week, I found this and I love it, it's one sentence. But I love how something so short can be so profound. He said, I wish not merely to be called Christian, but also to be Christian. And that's my prayer for you. I've been praying for you that you would move beyond just confession of who Jesus is, but that that belief would lead you to act and be committed fully to Jesus that you would move from decided to disciple, that you would be all in and all for all that God has planned for you. And I'll promise you, and it, when you commit fully to God, you get to watch him work in your life. And if we will do that as a church, then we will watch him do things that will just blow our minds here at Kara City. So, Decision time. What are you gonna do? Will you remain decided or be discipled? Are you in or are you out? Let's pray.